We're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Division of Military Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York, the 30th of April, 2004, approximately 9.15 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russick. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is William A. Millett. August 8th, 1925, Oneonta, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I was, attended Christian Brothers Academy. Uh, was forced to get out in three years due to draft quotas. I did graduate. That was immediately drafted into the Army. Okay, so you were drafted. Do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was, I was waiting, I was waiting for a, uh, I was waiting for a bus in Waterbury to go to a football play, go down and play football in uh, at CBA. Mm -hmm. um, how were, was it announced to you, or? It was just a, just somebody had told me about it. Mm -hmm. They had heard it on the radio and and told me about it. Do you remember your reaction? My only reaction was, "What? Where's Pearl Harbor?" Yep, that's most. Uh, I had no idea. Of it. In fact, I probably I don't, th I don't think I ever heard of it and knew, and knew where it was, mm -hmm. and very little knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so you were you were drafted. What year was that? 1944. Okay, um, where did you go for your basic training? Fort Sill, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. in the uh, Pack Artillery. All right, could you explain what pack artillery is? Pack artillery is a special arm of the uh, Army's artillery. Uh, their basic, their weapon is the 75 millimeter pack howitzer, which can be broken down and disassembled into 10 individual pieces and mounted and carried by six Army mules. Uh, in order to qualify to get into the pack artillery, uh, when you went through the reception center at, at uh, Fort Sill, the sergeant stood at the top of the line and, in, and measured everybody going through. Anyone 5, 10, or taller went in the pack artillery. Everyone less than that went to the regular artillery. And as I recall, the only time we ever rode was the time that tr the trucks picked us up at the train and the time the trucks took us back to the train when we left Sill. Uh, after our second, second or third week of basic training, we never, we never walked less than 14 miles a day, and uh, it was very, uh, very strenuous training. Our uh, PT was ongoing constantly to keep us in top physical shape. Mm -hmm. How long would it take to uh, disassemble and reassemble a, a pack howitzer? Train a train crew. Uh, How many in the crew? Well, at basically in the pack artillery section, there are there are 13 people. There is a chief of section and six cannoneers and six mule handlers. And it took it took approximately a minute to disassemble that howitzer uh, and pack it onto a mule or take it off the mule and assemble. It. We could have we could have that howitzer off a mule in, in less than a minute, ready to fire. So, at the, and that's that's a well trained crew. Mm -hmm. Okay, how long were you uh, at cell? Uh, sixteen weeks, seventeen weeks, mm -hmm. seventeen weeks. And uh, most of your training then was this very specialized. Yes. Training. We were uh, at cell. We were uh, due to the type of. Uh, t type of our training and the type of weapon we we're training on and a potential for where we would be serving, uh, we had to qualify in all types of weapons. Uh, uh, because most of the pack artillery battalions were then serving in the South Pacific. Most of them were, a lot of them were Merrill's Marauders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where were you eventually assigned? I finished my basic training, was sent to uh, Camp Carson, Colorado, uh, and assigned to the 613th Pack Artillery Battalion, 
Fortunately for me, when I got the Carson, the 613th had already shipped out to the West Coast, heading for the South Pacific. Uh, at that time, they had to know what to do with us. And after about two or three days of, of doing nothing, they or other than PT, they sent us over to a place called Cheyenne Mountain, Camp Carson, for rock climbing. Why at that time, we had no idea. But eventually, we got our shipping orders to go to uh, Camp Hill, Colorado, with the 10th Mountain Division. While at Carson, while we were rock climbing, at, at, at each day progressed and we ascended higher into the rocks and so forth and looked down. I was not particularly happy with what I saw below me and found a, a, upon our return to our barracks that there was a big bulletin issuing a call for immediate volunteers for the Airborne. So I said to this one fellow from Chicago, his name was Gary Spiller, I says, I've had enough of this rock climbing. So we went over and joined, volunteered to join the paratroopers, took our physical, passed with flying colors, all set. Unfortunately, at that time, we got shipping orders to go to the 10th Mountain. Got to the 10th Mountain, uh, informed the sergeant that wherever we were at some headquarters, that we wouldn't be staying at the 10th Mount. We were going to go in the airborne, and we were very politely but firmly informed that your days of the airborne are over. You're now in the 10th Mountain. You're going to stay here. So that was it. And then we went from from we went from uh, Camp Hale to uh, Camp Swift, Texas, for flatland training. Uh, purpose, the main purpose being that the difference in altitudes from uh, firing weapons and mortars and artillery at 11 and 12,000 feet elevation is a lot different from firing at uh, ground level. So your, your ballistics are a lot different. We had, had to get trained for that. Okay. Now, um, the 10th Mountain, a lot of the infantry units were ski units. You didn't have to do any skiing? Or do yes. You know? uh, we had to be proficient. We had to be proficient in some skiing uh, uh, and able to move around in the snow because we had to, many times we had to and, uh, uh, break the ground for the mules going through the snow uh, primarily because some of the some, sometimes the snow was crusted and the crust would eat into their skin and so we had to break ground for them. Uh, Snowshoes were adamant. We had to we had to be proficient in using mm -hmm. snowshoes. Had you ever skied before this, or uh, when I was a when I was a real youngster in Oneana, we had a hill in the back of our house. We did all those skiing. Mm -hmm. That was about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when did you go overseas? We went over. We left the uh, United States in December of '44, and got over there in early early January. No. Off camera before, what was the makeup? You talked about the makeup of the 10th Mountain. How many infantry units were there, and how many artillery? We had the 10th was made up of uh, three inf mountain infantry regiments: the 85th, the 86th, and 87th Mountain Infantry Regiments. These were supported by the 604th, the 605th, and the 616th Pack Artillery Battalions into regimental combat teams. Now, uh, how did you go overseas? USS General Meigs, a troop ship. Mm -hmm. Every uh, the whole unit in, on one ship. Our whole our whole battalion, yes, yeah. and and some of the uh, we had infantry, uh, our battalions, our, our artillery, but three bata uh, battalions, and uh, there were some other units on board. It was a big, it was a big ship. Mm -hmm. Was it in a convoy or? Yes, definitely. Oh, yes, in a mm -hmm. convoy, in a very very rough sea, I might add. Uh, what was your destination? Naples, okay. which we didn't know at the time until we got on board the MiGs and we were, uh, our natural curiosity, you know, as to some of the naval crew members, uh, if they, where we were heading, he said, he said this, and I always remember his mark remark, he said, 
this tub has been nowhere but Naples. So we knew where we were heading for Italy. And then we got to Italy, we disembarked, walked down the down the quay, <coughs> excuse me, and got on an LCI. The LCI was supposed to take us up the coast of Leghorn. And uh, on our way up, we had a tremendous storm in the Mediterranean. Uh, and, uh, and I might add that an awful lot of our guys were, were seasick. It was unbelievable. Uh, the storm was so bad that uh, the, fan, the fan tail back where the, the uh, latrine was cracked right in half. So we had to turn around and put it into port. Okay, um, well, could you just tell us about the campaigns in Italy when you ended up entering combat and so on? We, uh, we, were truck we went into a uh, staging area around Pisa, Luca, uh, where we had to get, our, uh, get the howitzers out of Cosmoline and get cleaned up and oriented. Then we, we, trucked, we, trucked up by the, we trucked up to a place called Lozano in Belvedere, where we, uh, we were emplaced and put our weapons in and began our firing missions. And prior to the infantry assault on on uh, Belvedere and River Ridge, then we went from there up to Monica, up up to uh, up through the campaign with the rest of the division. So you were involved in the River Ridge. Yes, yes. Uh, my particular assignment. Uh, well, I was was not assigned to a particular gun section as a cannoneer or whatever. Uh, I was assigned. I was assigned as a security person uh, with a BAR to provide uh, perimeter security for the battery. Uh, that meant by being out two, three, four hundred yards in front of them to intercept enemy patrols and that type of thing. Uh, also. <clears throat> to provide security for our forward, forward observers and uh, on the o and up on the OP. So as a result, we got I was up on the OP with at, at, we, when we supported the 86 when they went up to Reaver Ridge, uh, provided security for our forward observers. It was quite often uh, the infantry wasn't around, and we have had incidents where where the Germans uh, counterattacked and sought out weak spots and that was my primary job to provide security. What did you think of the BAR? I loved it. I loved it. Uh, contrary to a lot of people uh, did, that hated it uh, and uh, the only reason I can think they hated it, they didn't know how to handle it or they didn't, or they didn't keep it maintained and keep it clean. I kept mine immaculate at all times and I never had a problem with it. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, keep the bicon on it? No, that that uh, that got an early death. <laughs> now, uh, do you think your equipment and clothing was sufficient for for the you know change of seasons and that? Oh, definitely, definitely. We experimented. Uh, the division experimented in Colorado uh, with a, a myriad of a. Uh, of equipment and clothing and so forth. Uh, it seemed that every every clothing manufacturer or uh, had a friend, a politician friend, who wanted the army to use their equipment. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we we in the mountains we became a, a testing ground for this equipment and clothing. Some was good, some was bad. We had a uh, one instance we had a pair of quick release binders on skis. That guaranteed that uh, as soon as we clicked them, uh, hit, hit our heels together, those skis would come off. Well, unfortunately, when you're going downhill, sometimes your heels come together inadvertently, oh, and uh, off you go. Mm -hmm. So they didn't work out. And that was just one of them. And some of the sleeping bags, some of the sleeping bags we experimented with, uh, froze up on us, so to speak. When we were inside them, our breath froze in the zippers and so forth, and uh, they didn't work out. But uh, in comparison, at that time, 
when we were particularly or in Italy and saw what the other regular infantry divisions had in the way of winter, winter equipment and clothing. Uh, ours was just far, far superior. We had uh, parkas and we had uh, shoe packs and so forth. And uh, we were very comfortable. I, I, I can't ever remember saying it where I, where I was really, really cold, you know, in spite of sitting out on the side of a mountain somewhere all night long, you know, in about 20 below zero or 10 below zero. Uh, I can't say that I was ever really, really uncomfortable. Did you carry a lot of rations with you? Uh, the only rations we carried were actually on the, when we were on the move was K rations. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were issued C rations at some at some times, but primarily they issued us K rations. Mm -hmm. How how was uh, food for the uh, mules? How was that carried? Uh, they carried their own. Uh, we had. Uh, we had special on those on those mules. They had what they call a Phillips pack saddle, and the Phillips pack saddles were common for every mule, except of course they had to be fitted a little bit different. But uh, they had a rack and adapter on the top of the saddle, which you could, which was the adapter to put the different various parts of the howitzer on, plus the fact uh, of carrying hay, uh, oats, and that and grain and that type of thing. Uh, water, ammunition, whatever. So they all had a little di di different uh, adapter on them. So we were when the uh, pack when the pack companies went into the mountains or artillery went in. Uh, we were self we were self sufficient. How did the uh, mules react to the, the cannon fire? Did they were they used to it or did they? No, no. They they shied. They were they're uh, they're very sensitive to noise to, to noise and so forth. Uh, no, we didn't. The problem, uh, although we were a pack artillery and trained with mules, we didn't get our mules until, we didn't get our mules, in fact we were one of the very few units, the only units that I know of, uh, that used the mules on, when we jumped off on April 14th on our final offensive out, at, out of the Apennines. And we had, we had mules and they weren't all was a, what I call a GI mule, because our GI mules were big, big animals, and these were a little bit smaller. Some of them were. Uh, I, I, ha, I have one that was a was a regular size, was a regular mule. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, we didn't have any problem with them. Nope. Were they stubborn or fairly oh. easy to, to handle? <laughs> well, believe me when I tell you, there is nothing on this God's earth as ornery as a Missouri mule. Uh, they are intelligent. Uh, they're hard. They're tough. Uh, a mule is uh, is a lot smarter than a horse will ever be. Uh, I've seen I've seen them do stuff that was <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, I had one take off on me, and I'm holding the halter, and I can't hold him. And he ran he ran me up against the side of a, between a tree, so that uh, he ran so close to that tree, I had to go to go the halter. You know. They're just, uh, they're just bad news. <laughs> I've been kicked by one, uh, one amusing incident. Uh, taken basic in Fort Sill. No, I was in. We were down at Camp Swift, and we had a had a stable sergeant. His name was was down there, and uh, he was a Southern boy from, from South Carolina, and the mules were his specialty. And he got, the, he, had got, he got some of the guys chewing tobacco. He said, I don't want to see your boy smoking. He says, oh. So he got me chewing tobacco. Well, I chewed tobacco until I was cleaning out the hoof of one of our mules. And he just drew back that hoof and kicked me square in the butt and sent me flying. When he did that, I swallowed the cud. <laughs> I'll tell you, I was I'll tell you, I was about sick for two days, so that was one amusing incident about the about the mules. But they were they were uh, an amazing animal. Uh, they're sure-footed, uh, and just and I said, just said before, they're really really tough. We weren't, and I say the artillery wasn't obviously it wasn't the only ones. We had the Alpini, the Italian Alpini. Uh, did a lot of service for the uh, for the tent. Uh, in fact, they had a an Alpini Mountain Company 
attached to a uh, pack a pack a unit attached to each regiment, and each and all the all the all the regiments had had uh, pack service when in their service companies had uh, had pack pack platoons and used mules. They had to. That's the only way they could get ammunition and water up in the mountains. You must have had a, a, a unit too that did blacksmithing. You know, oh yeah, yeah. Replaced the we shoes. We had uh, we had five, we had five thousand mules in our division. It was our basically our organic transportation, and every I know every artillery battalion had a service service battery, and that was where the uh, shoers were and the saddle makers and all that type of thing. And uh, when I was the t saddle makers, these guys were really good. Uh, and th at that time, they had nothing but the best of leather. When I mean, you couldn't, when you couldn't get leather, and the civilians couldn't get leather. These guys had the best leather you could, you could get. Um, so your all of your campaigning wasn't in Italy itself. Our combat. Yes. Our combat was in Italy. Yes, mm -hmm. it ended. As a matter of fact, our combat ended on uh, May 2nd, 1945, and today is the anniversary of one of our big campaigns, April 30th, up, up on Lago de Garda in northern Italy, where we, when we went in, uh, well, our battery uh, went in on a, an amphibious assault and ducks uh, to go around blowing out tunnels on the lake to support our infantry, and this is... Uh, this is, in fact, the anniversary of it. Do you describe that? I've never heard of that action. Uh, uh, you fired the howitzers from the, the docks? Yeah. No, no. No, oh, okay. no, no. We, we, disassembled, we disassembled the howitzers, put them on the docks with ammunition, and went up the lake. Uh, and then when we, the ducks pulled into a, a disembarked area where we were under fire, uh, we carried, hand carried those those pieces up a steep steep embankment mm -hmm. onto the road. There was a uh, Lago de Garda is a very beautiful lake. In fact, Mussolini had one of his palaces up there, and uh, there was a series of the road was built right into the side of the mountain, and there were tunnels actually that uh, a series of five or six tunnels. And the Germans, in their retreat, blew these tunnels, cut some of these tunnels, so that to halt our progress. So as a result, we had to go around them in ducks uh, to support our infantry. In fact, they had they had a couple of uh, 88s up at the head of them, up in Torbali that uh, were firing into our troops, and uh, we went up and we duked them out. Uh, this is where I got my Bronze Star, and we duped them out, uh, knocked, knocked the deviates out. So that then, uh, see, actually, what it amounted to was that our some of our infantry were actually trapped up there because they couldn't, even if they had to, they couldn't get back down because the tunnels were blowing up behind them. The Germans, in their haste to blow these tunnels, had prematurely blown one and trapped one of their own truck full of engineers. Uh, and I think there were like 15 or 20 German soldiers in that truck that were killed. So then uh, we went up on the, the infantry, our infantry went into Torbali and, re, uh, and uh, we went in behind them and uh, the war ended on May 2nd. We went, in. our assignment when we jumped off on April 14th, uh, we were part of a task force my battalion, our battalion was part of the task force with 82nd Infantry, 86th Infantry, I'm sorry. And uh, our mission was to go like hell, pell-mell, and go, no, nothing stop you, and get over the pole, get over the pole River and up into and seal the Brenner Pass to prevent the Germans from getting back in there. And at that time, there was a great deal of concern that if the Germans got back into those mountains, we'd be... Ten years digging them out, so our job was to one of our jobs was to seal that runner pass, and make sure they didn't get back. But um, how did you stay in occupation at all? Yes, uh, I, 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 the 
time escapes me, but we were there for a little while up in, uh, up, uh, up in Torbaly. Then we got orders to move to the east coast. To the, uh, they were having, uh, having some problems in Trieste with the Yugoslavians. Uh, the Yugoslavians uh, moved into Trieste and claimed that, claimed that city, that port city, as our own, which, which, which an Italian city. And we had orders to go across the top of uh, Italy to Trieste, which we did. And uh, we finally, we were over there with the British, and they, uh, finally the British conned, conned the uh, Yugoslavs into surrendering. They, had, they put them in a, they invited them into a huge soccer field, and these guys were armed right to the teeth. Uh, and uh, the British colonel uh, invited them to lay down their arms. War was over. Uh, go home to your farms, your homes, and so forth. And uh, leave your weapons here. And when he said that, the uh, Yugo has become a little restless. And then the colonel, I re always remember the colonel saying, if he had an interpreter, uh, if you choose not to lay down your weapons, look behind you or around you. And the place was completely surrounded with British and American troops with automatic weapons. So they got the message and dropped their weapons and filed out. Then we went up into a little place called Lago di Fadil, right in the corner of uh, Yugoslavia, Austria, and Italy. A beautiful little valley. And there we were. We stayed on occupation until we came home. We visited, we went over, got a chance to go over to Villach, Klagenfurt, Austria. Uh, do some skiing, uh, and do some, did a lot of road work, exercising, so, you know, PT. But life was good then. <laughs> did you get to see any USO shows or anything? We got to see one, I think we got to see one show. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the plus features of that was that we were, at, we're up in, uh, we were in, uh, up in the, uh, Better pass. We came across huge, huge caverns. Uh, the doors were, I don't know, 15 foot wide and probably another 15 feet high. They were dug into the mountain. And the first one we went into, uh, we, we had engineers, fortunately, we had engineers with us who probed, probed them for mines and booby traps. And the first one we went into was a cavern loaded with brand new, brand new Pratt Whitney engines uh, from Ohio. I don't know, Akron or where they were made, but I know they had, you know, I remember they were made in Ohio somewhere. And these were airplane engines that were in there. And we went down and checked them out. But one of the big cavern we went into was just loaded with uh, kegs of German beer, uh, German brandy, and champagne that you would not believe. And uh, fortunately, our division people, we got unloaded trucks, and we got that stuff out of there before. We were waiting for one of the other divisions from southern France to come up to meet us in the Brenner Pass. And we knew, you know, that they declared that somewhat, so there was some other territory. And we knew we had to get that stuff out of there before they got up there to get their hands on it. So as a result, when we went up into Dill, everybody got a huge ration of champagne and uh, brandy and whatever, and uh, we, had, we had a good time. <laughs> what were your relations like with the uh, Italian people? Did you have much contact? Uh, no, not really. We had some. We had some. Uh, and our relations, as far as, uh, as, far as I know, it was, it was excellent. Uh, I know we were in one position, and... Uh, there's a little farmhouse down to our right, and uh, we watched this woman come out every once in a while. We were, we've been there, we, we were there for a while. And she came out, and we she was obviously very, very pregnant. And uh, it's the first time I ever realized how the Italians made, how they made spaghetti. Uh, you know, they rolled it out, they brought it out, and laid it over a clothesline. And that's why there's a loop in it, in it to dry. 
but she was very obvious. And uh, came time to have, she, she had her baby while she was there, and we had, and our medics were there to help her and so forth. And uh, the, the only, the biggest problem we had with, with the children, the kids, uh, got, you know, they were uh, impoverished. They were just so poor, it was unbelievable. And uh, as a result, you know, you had to watch, watch your equipment because they would come in and take whatever they could get. Uh, it was, in today's, in today's uh, attitude, they, they were just completely poverty stricken. And uh, when we finished going, we, we had a, if our uh, mess sections were in operation and we were getting hot food and so forth, uh, they'd stand at the end of the mess line and take, take your scraps. You know, and uh, any way they could get them, coffee, they'd take coffee, they would take, you know, begging for cigarettes and candy and so forth. So, uh, and they were not above taking, if you laid something down mm -hmm. and it had any value, it would be gone. So, that was the only experience we had. And I had, I had a very fortunate experience. We were in Pradil. We used to bring our clothing up to an Italian family up the northern end of the lake. And uh, when we got ready to leave, they invited, there was three of us, invited us up to have a farewell dinner on a Sunday. And I think it was a 12 or 13 course dinner, my God. They had pasta and they had all kinds of stuff. One of the items they had that I didn't recognize at first was snails, you know, in sauce, which I... I finally found out what it was, but uh, they, they treated us very well. And of course, we obviously they did our did our washing and clothes and so forth, that we, which we paid for. So that was that was a, that was a good, nice nice experience with them. They were very nice people. When did you return home? August, 1945. Uh, prior to that, they had the army had come up with propaganda about the war and our role in it and the war is still going on in the Pacific. And we were informed that since we were one of the last, actually the last division in Italy to arrive in Italy, that we were going to be redeployed to the United States, refitted and shipped to the Pacific. And I have and I have uh, plans, I came by some plans some years ago of our position or of our, in the assault, on, final assault on Japan. So, an interesting, another interesting point about our artillery, it's, uh, and at this time it doesn't make any difference, but at that time it was top secret. We were having, you know, the, the Greeks were fighting for their independence against the communists in, in Greece. And they were having a real battle, and they asked for help. And officially, you know, President Roosevelt, being the ultra liberal that he was, didn't want to thought he could control Joe Stalin, and didn't want to offend the communists. However, somehow or other, they decided, and they shipped, they shipped all of our artillery to the Greeks for the use of their army. And we sent something like 20 or 24 of our artillerymen along with them and, and uh, some of the mules to uh, train the Greek army in their use. And that, that never came out. It was never made public until many years later. As a matter of fact, I was at a National Guard conference in Kayamisha many years ago when uh, they, had, they had films and that type of thing and it showed what they had done. So uh, obviously when the atomic bombs are dropped, what were your emotions? Uh, one of great relief until we found out we were heading for the South Pacific, <laughs> uh, to we're heading for Japan. Uh, yeah, we were very relieved. We had survived, uh, as obviously a lot of our guys did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, some bitter, bittersweet moments. We had our memorial services and that type of thing. Uh, and they were, they were bittersweet moments. When we, and, and we have a, 
in our asso division association, we have many, many uh, annual and semi-annual meetings and so forth in the chapters. When we have never, ever, ever forgotten these people that we lost over there. There's a huge cemetery in Florence where they are buried and so forth. And we have a, the division association that goes back to Italy every two or three years. And uh, it's always a stop at the at Florence Cemetery. We have a memorial service. But whenever we gather, whenever we gather in the group, uh, they're always remembered. Now you uh, were discharged. Did you? When did you join the National Guard? Right away, or no? I, a friend of mine talked me, conned me into that. Uh, I'm going to say this. I got 46, uh, probably around 47 or 48. You know, and he, he wanted me to go over to the 105th in Troy, 105th Infantry in Troy, and I said, friend, oh, I've seen that. I said, those people get hurt. So I, I did. I joined a, a National Guard unit in Albany, an artillery unit. So, and I rose to the ranks, became a first lieutenant, battery commander, then a company commander of tank company, and so forth. When, when did you leave the guard? See, I don't remember what year it was. I was. I know I had about 16, 17 years of military service, and uh, between between ROPA and politics and so forth, I got out. Uh, I was, I was in a position with the bank that uh, they were they frowned on it, and uh, as a result, called, I couldn't get the time to devote to the guard. I couldn't get the time to go to school to in order to gain promotion to stay out of Ropa. Uh, so as a result, I just had to get out. So somewhere in the '60s. Yeah, I'm gonna 60s. say. Yeah, I'm gonna say around that. Yeah, somewhere in the '60s. Um, so most of your sir, you never were called up during Korea, or no? As a matter of fact, we uh, there's an interesting point. We were at Camp Wellfleet, and at that time we had uh, uh, the M42s, uh, and we were at, over at Wellfleet on a firing training mission, and uh, we got a call, got a call from battalion headquarters that. Uh, all the company, all the battery commanders, immediately. So we went back to uh, battalion headquarters, and we were informed at that point that word had been received from Albany that our battalion was being mobilized, was being federalized. It seems that some smart infantry commander realized that these AAA battalions with the automatic M42s that fired up could fire. Uh, 120 rounds a minute off a dual, off those dual barrels of an M42, plus the quad 50s that were mounted on the back of an, uh, a half track, was much more valuable to infantry support than than they were any aircraft. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the army immediately, you know, saw the wisdom of this, and they started shipping all their regular army AAA units as well as federalizing National Guard units, of which we were one. So we were told at that time that we're, upon re return to Albany, we would be federalized. Uh, politics again took over. And I, I, I can't remember who the governor was at that time or what happened, but anyway, by the time we got back to Albany, or in the interim immediately after, uh, our battalion, was assigned and became part of the 27th Infantry Division. And at that time, if you wanted anybody in the National Guard, you had to take the whole whole division. So we did not get federalized. So that was about the sum and substance of it. Did you ever use the GI Bill? Yes. Yeah, I used it to go to Siena. So that was... Uh, <laughs> That was a, uh, we went to Siena College when, uh, after the war in 40, 46, yes. Uh, that was a, a zoo out there. I mean, there were more guys than GIs and you could throw a stick out there. It, it just place was overwhelmed. Uh, Quonset huts, you know, going to class in the Quonset huts in the winter. It was not the easiest thing in the world.
bill. Do you use the 5220 club? And I use the 5220, yes. Yep, I use the 5220, yep. Right almost to the hilt, I guess. I attended bar, I attended bar when I was going to Siena and uh, at the 5220. And so we were, we were making out all right. Um, obviously, you, you've joined veterans organizations or re association yep. organizations. Yeah, we have our we have a uh, a very viable Tenth Mountain Division Association. We has broke down to like you know, twenty chapters in the United in the country. And at, at present, I'm the president of the Upstate New York chapter, which covers from up at every every place outside of New York City. Did you join the American Legion or the? I'm a, or? I'm a life member of the American Legion, and <clears throat> currently uh, currently the adjutant of our Legion post. A uh, member of the VFW and Waterloo League, past, past All-State Commander, uh, currently Quartermaster of the VFW. Very Your, uh, I guess this, you answered this in a way with Boeing and your association, were there, you stayed in contact with those that served with you then, or you served with? Very much so, mm -hmm. very much so. As a matter of fact, uh, there's one fellow down in Phoenicia that was in our battery and we're stay in contact and there's a lot of and we have uh, every area you now our chapter our division association chapter is broke is, is regionalized if you will uh, we have an Adirondack region we have a capital district region we have a, a central New York chapter and we have a Niagara mm -hmm. chapter or region or mm -hmm. area so these are all run by vice presidents of the, of the association and and each one has our own has our own celebration and memorial services and so forth. We have our big one here in Albany on February 19th to commemorate our assault on River Ridge. Then we have our annual. Then we have an annual meeting of all the of the, of the chapter itself. Last year we had it in September out in out in, out in Geneva. Uh, this year we'll probably I'm, I'm having it up at. Uh, Garnet Hill Lodge and up near the, the, up past Lake George. So, so they're very, very active. In fact, it's probably, I would venture to guess, I would venture to guess it's, as a, an association, division association, it's probably the most active association in, a, in the Army. Mm -hmm. How would you say your time in service had an effect or changed your life? Uh, basically, uh, it made me appreciate life more, uh, what life is all about. Uh, I became much more conservative in my attitude uh, as opposed to uh, conservative, as opposed to liberals. Uh, the value of life, the value of way people live and how they carry themselves. Uh, I've watched this country, I've watched this country deteriorate, you know, since World War II and continue in that vein. Uh, the liberalism that permeates our society is just, it's, it's incredible. And uh, the liberal, the liberalism of the courts and the judges is just, it's just incredible. It's just, it's a, it's a tragedy, it's a tragedy because they permitted this country to uh, morally, morally uh, degrade themselves. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview.